crucifix. Ad Torim Nostrum in Omni Domini, we fetch a chair of a Tehran, and the Father's Son of the Ghost. Take a seat. All right, take the uh, encyclical, and in the very back on page 47, on page 47, <coughs> you have there Lamentabili Sane. So this is another syllabus of errors. Anybody know who the first syllabus of errors was? Yeah, the great Pius IX in uh, 1864, and Archbishop Lefebvre, in his last conference, he he says that the syllabus of errors of 1864, Lamentabili Sane of 1907, and Pascendi of 1907, he says these were these were explosive at the time. They just dropped the bomb in the middle of the Disney World dream, dream world. And uh, shook, tried to shake the Catholics back to Catholic thinking, back to reality. The objective truth of the Catholic faith. So in this, in, in this Lamentabili Sane, at the, at, it's the addendum to the encyclical Pascendi, he has a whole list. Of all the errors, there are 65 errors that are listed. In the syllabus of errors, it's something like up to 72 or 80. <clears throat> and these errors are one after the other just condemned, condemned, condemned. So there's no ambiguity, there's no confusion. So Archbishop, the, the great St. Pius X, he exposes the modernists, shows their teaching, and that's what we're studying with Father Pfeiffer's covering, and, and it's summed up in this. And then he also gives the remedies, and Father Pfeiffer will cover that at the end of the encyclical, how to combat modernism. And he, he, he enlists all the forces of the church, the bishops, the priests, to combat modernism and stay faithful to the Catholic Church of Tradition. So Archbishop Lefebvre said that these documents divided Catholics already. We saw Vatican II divided the conciliar church and the Catholic Church. But this division has been going on since liberalism hit the scene, and that's basically with Protestantism and then the French Revolution. So, if we can just put a little, you might be wondering, what is this? <laughs> so, this is just a little bit of a, from the eyes of the faith, which is the only real vision of history that matters. <coughs> because everything in scripture is from the eyes of God. So when a kingdom falls or a kingdom builds up, it's always centered on the faith. On the faith. The Israelites, when they are good, they're loyal to God, they obey His commandments. When they're bad, which happens a lot, it's up and down, the history of the Israelites. When they're bad, it's because they fall to ecumenism, mixed marriages, and they abandon the faith. Ecumenism and apostasy. So, if we could just have a big one view of the history of the world from Adam and Eve and the creation from Almighty God, Adam is created. <clears throat> and then you have the, the history of the Israelites. I'm not going to go through the whole Old Testament here. Um, but there will be, after the flood of Noah, the, the, the ages of Adam to Noah to Abraham and 
I'm not going to go through all that. Bishop Williamson has, in the past, done a very good summary of Venerable Holzhausen, Bartholomew Holzhausen, who talks about the seven ages of the church. You're all familiar with that, right? And Bishop Williamson, for many years, has been summarizing that. We were taught that in the seminary. And it's very, very good. So this is the same kind of picture, <coughs> but um, from the Adam and Eve to from Abraham, you have the beginning of the Israelites. The Jews are chosen, and they're supposed to be the ones to receive the, the Messiah, the Redeemer, which is the second person of the Blessed Trinity who took on flesh at the Incarnation. This is the center of all history, the Incarnation. Now this is a bit, obviously this is, it's not fair to history to put it in this compact picture right here, but here you've got 6,000 years before Christ, and this is bigger, which is just 2,000 years after Christ. So you can see it's it's um <coughs> it's not 100% accurate obviously in every way but I'm, I'm just making a point with this. <coughs> so the Israelites they're chosen by God to prepare for him. The Gentiles are the the nations such as the Roman and the Greek pagan nations that fell from the primitive revelation and had, had crumbs of it in their false beliefs. So when Christ actually did come after the 6,000 years from Adam to the second Adam, you have the launching of the whole mission of the Catholic Church down to the second coming of Christ. So between the first coming and the second coming, As the fathers of the church always talk about, you all you have the vision of history. All history is centered on Christ, his coming before and when he came, and then once he came, the first coming to the second coming. That's all of human history. So in a nutshell, in a very brief nutshell, and, and I, I know this is open to every kind of criticism, but it's the only way we can get it from an eagle's, an eagle's vision, right? The vision of history. The first ages of the church, you have the age of the apostles, who are commanded by Christ, go preach to all nations, go spread the Catholic faith, all those who believe and are baptized, not in the name of Allah, not in the name of Buddha, but in the name of the true God, the Father, the Son, Holy Ghost. Those who are baptized will be saved. Those who reject it will be condemned. So Christ is not an option. And he proves it by his miracles and his ascension into heaven. The apostles and our blessed mother watched our Lord ascend. Physically ascend. And he was brutally beaten 40 days before in the Passion. So everything about our Lord is, proves He's God and all the miracles. And the modernists, they are so wretched, as we're going to see very soon, how they attack the, our Lord Jesus Christ Himself. They attack the Gospels. They attack all the fundamentals of, of, our, of the Catholic faith. And that's why St. Pius X raised such a... Uh, fury against the modernists and rallied all the clergy to fight against him. And in those days, 1907, he, he, most of the bishops backed him. And only a few were going against him and the syllabus of errors. Now the proportion has gone to the reverse. All the bishops have gone against Martin St. Pius X and the syllabus of errors and the position of Archbishop Lefebvre, obviously. They've gone all against it, and only a few. Now, how many bishops now? You see this picture over here? 
<laughs> Here is the general in the middle of combat. Archbishop Lefebvre is in war. It's 1988. This is uh, right when the night before Rome called him, Cardinal Ratzinger, and said, look, we're going to send you a limousine, come down to Rome and we'll have more discussions. And Archbishop Lefebvre said, enough discussions. You've played games with me, you've lied me with me, you've tried to fool me, you give me promises, you promised me we can keep our seminaries, we can keep the Latin Mass, we can even preach against modernism. You promised me I could have a bishop, but it's, we cannot work together because you are AM, we are FM. We're going against completely opposite direction. We cannot work together. You, modernist Rome, want to de-Christianize, uncrown Christ the King, and spread your modernism everywhere. We want to fight for Christ the King and stay faithful to what Christ and the Church has handed down. We cannot work together. So in this combat, when he's about to be excommunicated the very day after, I had the happiness as a seminarian to be here. Uh, I was sitting actually uh, way over on this side of the altar. And uh, the four bishops are there, consecrated. Their mission, hold the Catholic faith. Take care of the sheep. Feed the flock. You don't have jurisdiction, only the Pope can give that. That's clear, that's understood. But your mission as bishops, keep the faith until Rome comes back to tradition. Is that so difficult to understand? That's why, obviously, why we're all here and why this seminary exists. We have to maintain the fight until Rome comes back to tradition. So Bishop Fillet, who happened to be the first bursar, of the major bursar of the SSPX, the bursar is the one who holds the purse. I won't say more because, you know, among the twelve apostles, who also held the purse? I won't say more. But pray for them. Pray for all of them. And uh, Bishop Galaretta has been silent. Bishop Williamson, we know, has fallen to Navasoro, defending Navasoro Mass and excusing the council. Bishop Tissier, he's our hope that he could turn around. He's written the life of Archbishop Lefebvre. He was one of those priests in May of... May 5th, 1988, just a month before this, almost two months, he told Archbishop Lefebvre with a few of the priests, sign the protocol, sign the protocol, sign the protocol. And Archbishop Lefebvre did sign. And that night, before the tabernacle, he said, I betrayed you, Lord, I know I betrayed you. And he, he took his signature off the next day because he saw it was a trap. It was a trap. So here the general, 1988, June 30th, one of the greatest events probably in the history of the church, equivalent to St. Athanasius, what he had to do to defend the faith. But now the four bishops have are fallen. And Bishop Tissier, who should know better, he's kind of just silent and going along. So pray for all of them, but this is the this is the state of the war right now. So Christ, his mission was spread the faith. Don't change it, don't compromise it. And what's the very definition of tradition, anybody? What is the what is tradition? <clears throat> In the Catholic understood as the Catholic definition of what is tradition as opposed from scripture. Scripture is all that is the, the written word of God written down and approved by the Catholic Church which books are canonical at the exclusion of books that are not canonical. So what is tradition in a nutshell? Spoken word. The spoken word. Does anybody know the, the basic catechism definition? The classic of Yes, it's the deposit of faith, the handing down, tradere in Latin. Tradere means to hand down. Hand down the baton. So tradition, and Archbishop Lefebvre mentioned this many times in his sermons, it's the handing down of the deposit of faith 
down the centuries. Until Christ comes at his second coming. So it's the handing down of the deposit of the faith. And what's the deposit of the faith? Everything contained in scripture and tradition. That can't be changed. So what's the duty of the apostles? And all the saints and popes down the centuries until Christ comes again, hand down the deposit of the faith. Again, it's a simple command. Like Archbishop Lefebvre, his command to his four bishops was very simple. Hold the faith until we have a perfectly Catholic pope. Then you can surrender your, your Episcopal authority to the decision of the pope. <clears throat> but until then, you don't compromise, you don't play games, you, you don't make false dialogues and agreements with modernist Rome. <clears throat> and that's why we're in, that's why we're in this, this, this uh, you know, <clears throat> battlefield of the resistance right now. <clears throat> so, back to the overall picture. Okay, so the apostles go out the Bible is not actually written until a, together, all combined as one book, about until about the year 399. <clears throat> After the apostles go out, they're already going to be the first martyrs. You have the age of the martyrs. You have the age of the fathers. Again, this is a little artificial because the first 300 years is going to be all blood, martyrdom. The year 400s, 500, 600, uh, 10 hundred a year, and then uh, 1500 here, that's 1517, 1717, 1917, 1962. Anybody know what that was? Yeah. 62 was the beginning of Vatican II, yes. <laughs> okay, so what you got is the devil, remember St. John in the Apocalypse, he talks about the four horses. The first horse is the white horse. The apostles go out to spread the faith. St. Thomas bilocates to South America. St. Thomas will be martyred in India. The other apostles will spread throughout all of Kuwait, Iraq, Turkey, and up even into Europe, and St. Andrew even into England, and then down into Africa. So the devil would have his revenge with the Muslims. He will, all those countries that were once Catholic fell to the Muslims about uh, 600 years later. So the age of the martyrs, the age of the fathers, the martyrs is the red horse, the fathers is the black horse. The fathers combat the black heresies that attack the Catholic faith. After the ten persecutions of Rome, ending in the year 313 with the Edict of Milan under, under the great, um, what's his name? Constance. Constance. He, 313, he will put the Edict of Milan and lift the persecutions. And he will himself convert to the Catholic faith. He'll be baptized a Catholic at his deathbed. The heresies, that is the black horse, this is all the attacks against our Lord Jesus Christ. Heresies of all sorts attack him. He's not God. Or he is God and he does not have a real body. Or he has a real body, but he's not God at all. Arianism. Or Christ has only one will and not two wills. Monothelitism. And then all these attacks against him in the church by the councils, all the 20 councils down to Vatican I, defend the Catholic faith and condemn heresies. And that's what the councils do in the history of the church. They're always dogmatic, and they're called together by the Pope 
with all the bishops of the world, or all those bishops that can make it. And they defend and teach the Catholic faith clearly under propositions. And then they condemn the errors clearly. So there's no confusion. All the Catholic people know, don't eat grass over there, you're going to get poisoned. Don't walk off the cliff over there, the wolves will push you over and eat you. Stay in the green pastures of Catholic tradition. And we are the sheep, and Mother Church guides the sheep, our Lord guides. So the fathers, the great fathers of the church, these fathers were the first to know the apostles, like St. Justin, St. Polycarp, he knew St. John. St. Hippolytus knew St. Polycarp who knew St. John. So you have the first wave of those who keep the Catholic faith after the apostles are called the fathers of the church. And that's why, if you know Protestants, and I'm sure most of you do, they're all about the Bible, the Bible, right? Try to get them to read tradition. The first wave of those after the apostles who all believe everything the Bible te teaches, but also all of Catholic tradition. The seven sacraments, the primacy of Peter, uh, purgatory, hell, heaven, the judgment, all these truths of the Catholic faith which are not named in the Bible, for example, Blessed Trinity, we believe in the Blessed Trinity, but it doesn't say that in the Bible, but we believe it. The, the word for purgatory is not existing in the Bible, but it's in the book of Maccabees and it fills some of the epistles of St. Paul. So it's the church united by the Holy Ghost who makes clear the teachings of Scripture. And St. Peter says there's many things in Scripture that many, by private judgment, <laughs> will interpret the Bible to their own destruction. And who can name one of the princes of darkness that even quoted Scripture to Christ? He quoted the psalm. Psalm 4. Uh, yeah, it was Lucifer who tempted Christ. Jump off the, jump off the pinnacle of the temple. And a ABC and NBC News will be there filming. And the angels will come and catch you. And then everyone will proclaim you as the Messiah. And Christ says to him, uh, Be God and Satan. So the, the fathers of the church are the defenders of the faith. And among them, St. Athanasius, St. John Chrysostom, St. Basil the Great, St. Hilary of Poitiers. And the fathers, the last of the fathers, will be up to the 1100 St. Bernard. St. Bernard is the last of the fathers. So, as Catholics, we have a great veneration for the fathers of the church. St. Thomas Aquinas, has a, has, they are part of the ordinary magisterium, the teaching of the church. And whatever is in conformity with scripture and the unanimous consent of the fathers, we have to believe as Catholics. Whatever goes against the scriptures and the unanimous consent of the fathers and the councils of the church, which is all part of tradition, which tradition can't change. Remember, it's the handing down of the deposit of the faith. So it's just handing down what's been given from the Blessed Trinity. So the age of the fathers, they are uh, defending against the black horse of heresies. And then, I would I call this the age of the monastics. That is the spreading of the Catholic faith all the way up to the high Middle Ages. You have the monks going out to convert the world. And they convert it by building cities of prayer, holiness, study, and, uh, and farming, all centered around the altar. You have a miniature Catholic city in the monastery under the rule of St. Benedict. And it will be ben St. Benedict's rule who is going to spread the farthest and be the most, the most uh, palatable for people. 
He's going to make saints, over 55,000 saints out of the Benedictine order. Pope Pius XII will call St. Benedict the father of Europe because many cities in Europe that have saints' names, they've started with monasteries and out, around them people moved and, and uh, became Catholic and the Catholic faith spread this way. So St. Boniface would go where? Germany and convert the German barbarians. Who will go to England? Another Benedictine monk with, I think, 30 monks. St. Augustine of Canterbury. And who will go to Ireland? St. Patrick, who, who went and lived several years in the monastery of Lerin in southern France. He will live as a monk, he will be ordained a priest, he will go to Rome, and he will be commissioned to go convert Ireland. And then, and then all throughout France, all throughout all of Europe, you have the monasteries being established, the spreading of the Catholic faith. And these monks, many of them are missionary monks. So they will live in the monastery, but also go out, like St. Bernard, to go preach the Crusades in the 10 and 11 hundreds. So the faith spreads. Poland becomes Catholic. France, of course, is Catholic. Spain becomes completely Catholic. Uh, Italy becomes Catholic. Ireland and all of Europe. In Ukraine, 988, the great Saint Vladimir will become Catholic. And he's looking for the true religion. Of course his grandmother was Catholic, Saint Olga. And he will have Muslims come and he will ask them about their faith, their, their religion. And they say, well we can't drink any wine. It's forbidden by our religion. And he said, well, my people love vodka and wine, so that's, that can't be the true religion. <laughs> and then the Jews came, and they kept bashing this person, our Lord Jesus Christ. And so he had, finally, the Catholic priests come up from Constantinople. And those were the Eastern Rite priests. So that came from St. John, who died in Ephesus. Uh, well, who was in Ephesus, his bones are there, and he lived there with the Virgin Mary. So St. John <clears throat> would begin the spreading of the faith there, and what developed there was the Byzantine rite of Mass. The Roman rite will die, will start with St. Peter when he's crucified in Rome. So the Eastern rite priest will come up, and St. Vladimir will hear about the faith. And he says, I want all my people to become Catholic with me. And all of Ukraine, everyone embraced the Catholic faith. Like Mexico in 1531, the priests were baptizing day and night. And it became a Catholic nation. So what you have here, uh, and in France in the 700s and 800s, the great Charlemagne unifies all his kingdom, which stretches from Germany to, to Spain and all of France and all of Belgium. All that is Catholic and it's unified with the Roman Rite, the Gregorian chant, the, the, the Tridentine Mass that we know it was the same Mass that he unified all of his kingdom with. So the faith spreads and catches fire. And this is the, the building up of the High Middle Ages, you say. The Middle Ages is a Catholic civilization rooted in sacred scripture, in the fathers of the church, and in the classical tradition. The classical tradition is the wisdom of the pagan ancients. For example, Aristotle and, 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 and uh, Plato with their philosophy. This will be baptized by the Catholic Church. St. Thomas Aquinas has whole commentaries on the metaphysics of Aristotle. <clears throat> and he doesn't even have to correct much of Aristotle. He baptizes him. So that's just one example. But remember Christ said, when I be lifted up, I will draw all things to myself. So Christ assumes he draws <clears throat> the best of all the ancient world. The Israelites prepare for him and all the scriptures, the Old Testament, but even the Gentiles, the Roman law, the barbarian raw material, 
and the Greek philosophy. All this will be baptized by the church. So that Saint Basil will write to his nephews and say, all right, you're going to learn about these pagan gods in school. But take what's good, leave what's bad. Imitate the, the bravery of Hercules. Imitate the virtue of Apollo. Imitate and uh, don't imitate what's evil in them. So that's what he's going to write to his nephews. So the church will do that. Take what's good and leave what's bad in the pagan world. And you have the, the real flowering of what's called the ages of the faith from about 500 to 1500. This is like the thousand year glory of the church. And Dom Garanger will call this the public life of our Lord. The, the, the Palm Sunday where he's acknowledged as king by all the world. And uh, every, every, the, whole, the whole world's Catholic. So we'll stop there and we'll pick up with this in the next class. But um, let me just close with a few quotes from St. Pius X, because this all ties in. Look at Lamentabile on page 47. <clears throat> These are all <laughs> condemned, starting with number one, the ecclesiastical law which prescribes the books concerning the divine scriptures, that is, what books are true and approved by the church, are subject to previous examination, does not apply to critical scholars and students of scientific exegesis of the Old and New Testament. So remember what Father Pfeiffer was, was stressing. Who's going to be the new gods that explain everything? The experts, the scholars, the scientists. So the Bible is subject to be believed except by the, the scholars and the ex exegete critics who are going to say, well, you can't believe Adam and Eve, really, it's just a story. Jonah and the whale was just a fictional story. And Noah's Ark was just a story. These wretched so-called scholars smash the whole scriptures and the faith. And St. Pius X is hammering them here and exposes them, these rats. Number two, the church's interpretation of the sacred books is by no means to be rejected. Nevertheless, it is subject to the more accurate judgment and correction of who? <clears throat> the so-called scholars and exegetes. An exegete is a scripture scholar, one who studies scripture. So, Saint Pius, so he condemns, St. Pius X here is condemning in number two, that, all right, the church has her interpretation, what we're supposed to believe with the Bible, but these modern scientists have a more accurate interpretation. So they, Sodom and Gomorrah was just a fictional story to scare people from the sin of perversion. <clears throat> so, for example, so, uh, so you see how wretched and how perverse modernism really is. This is just touching the surface. But they completely overthrow all the scriptures. They make a mockery of Catholic tradition. And that's why Archbishop Lefebvre, I mean, he saw clearly, you cannot work with these rats. Even if the rats are in white or purple or red, we cannot work with them until they come back to Catholic tradition. And that is, as St. Pius X will say, and Father Pfeiffer will, I'm sure, repeat it many times, What's one of the simple antidotes against modernism? Anybody? For the common Joe, for the, the sheep in the field? The Catechism. The Catholic Catechism of St. Pius X, the Council of Trent, and the old Baltimore Catechism. Not the new ones, beware of the new ones. But the old ones. And that, it's the simple, it's the simple baby Baby food are bite-sized Catholic faith. Anyone can follow it, anyone can understand it. Children of five years old, they can recite the catechism, and they know the faith, it's in their blood. And that's the biggest defense against the, the rot, rotten modernists. And the modernists will start developing 
with Protestantism. So we'll come to this, the, uh, the decline to the one world order and the apostasy. We'll come to that next time. Okay, we'll say a prayer. Since it's so tight, normally we kneel. But since it's so tight, just stay standing. We'll pay, pay standing. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, Amen. Gloria